please slow it down. Or, I'm sorry, I, I just realized I wasn't recording and Sydney asked me very specifically to record. Okay, so let me get back to the share screen, sorry. Okay, so let's go back to that one. So in words- Step by step. <laughs> yeah, so in words, ignore the calculations right now. I want you to think from a logical standpoint. I have a particular college, it could be anything. I could be talking about San Diego residents, but I'm saying 33% of the people that of this college fit into a particular slot. They're, they're called the freshman slot. So therefore, in, in simple English, no matter how big my sample is, 33% of my sample should be freshmen. Make it easy. If I have 100 people in my sample, then exactly 33 of them should be freshmen. Because if there's more than 33, then I'm overrepresenting freshmen. If there's less than 33, then I'm underrepresenting freshmen. That, that's it. It's actually that simple when it comes to the logic. Now, in terms of the numbers, uh, Salvador said it correctly. You take 0.33, which is 33% as a decimal, right? We take 0.33 and you multiply it by the number of people because 100 people, 1,000 people, a million people, obviously, 33% is always going to give me a different value. So I just take 0.33 times my sample size. Now, I'm pretty sure I did everything right. When I add up the numbers of my sample, it kind of has to add up to 200, doesn't it? Does everybody understand? So if I can't, I can't have it add up to another a, num a number other than 200, because then it's somewhere I, I it went wonky. If it if it makes it easier, change the question to 100 people in the sample. Then it's really so, easy. I have 33 freshmen, 27 sophomores, 21 juniors, 19 seniors, and that would be my answer. Okay. So since it's so 200, multiply, I'm sorry. Oh so no, keep on multiply so by the number of people. So you take the uh, the sample size. No, the sample size is 200. You take the the percentage. The percentage change into a decimal and multiply by the number of people or the total. Yeah. Now, do you know one of the reasons, one of the reasons, uh, by the way, you, you are now, you, you are the big person. You are the, the head of the company. You are the person who, who has the most to gain or lose. You, you own the television station. So you're hiring people to do things. And, and you have, you are also the statistician and you say, you know, I'm not going to go out and randomly ask 137 people. I'm going to pick a nice round number like a hundred or 200 or a thousand because then it makes it really easy to figure out how many people I'm supposed to ask. Why would you pick a number? Remember, you are doing the study. You are doing the poll. You can choose how many people you want. Would, you, would anybody here say, well, I'm going to pick 13 people to do this. Well, then I'm going to get decimals for each of these groups. And it's going to be kind of hard to figure out what I'm supposed to do. No, I'm going to pick 100 or a multiple of 100 therefore it's really easy mathematics and by the way in real life that's what people really do they really do do that now there are situations we talked about one of the biggest um i don't say liability that's that's the wrong word one of the the biggest limitations in polling and actually i said there's two it's time and money i'm trying to find out something but let's say there's any elections are probably the most common types of polls. There's an election and it's coming up really soon. And I want to do a really thorough poll and ask all the people on planet Earth. Well, I can't still be asking the question after the election's over. I kind of I kind of missed my mark, didn't I? I have to get all those those questions in and ask all the people before the election. So I am severely limited by how much time I have to do it. Does that make sense? Also, maybe I'm doing some sort of sampling that costs money to do. I always, I have fun with this later on in the course. You see, we want to test the brakes on a brand new Lamborghini. Do you guys know how all cars, how the brakes are tested on all cars? <laughs> it's called a crash test. You've probably seen commercials with the crash test dummies in the car and stuff. The only way you can test the brakes on a car is you have to crash the car. So I want to test the brakes on the brand new Lamborghinis. Um, small problem. <laughs> How many Lamborghinis do we have to crash to test the brakes? Because, well, they're really, really expensive cars, aren't they? Do <laughs> you see the problem there? Um, yeah, that, that test, I might not be able to test a lot of cars. Now, if it's a really cheap car, I can crash a lot of them maybe. But a really expensive car, 
money might be an issue. So in any type of poll, the nice thing about polls, if you're just asking questions, money is usually not an issue. I'm asking you a question. So where would, how could money come in? I wanna do a poll nationally. So I have to ask people all over the country. That means I have to hire people to ask people all over the country, or I'm traveling all over the country, flying from city to city. Now that starts getting costly. I have to pay people to work for me to ask the question, or I've got to fly around. Do you see what that, that now the money situation could come into effect, but the time I might have all the time in the world. I, I'm doing a study, um, the CDC, Every day of the week, 24 hours a day, is doing studies on COVID using prior information. And then next month, they'll have different information. They're not in a hurry. They're just constantly gathering information. And it's all statistical reports and researches. All the numbers we constantly hear, the percentages, think of those, the same as probability. If I say 50%, that means a probability of 0.5. <clears throat> so we're constantly getting information. So time is really not the issue. They're collecting data. Or is time the issue? If there's a danger, do you want to find out in six months that there's a danger, or do you want to find out today? You're saying I'm going to find out today. <laughs> well, today they're actually doing a poll on the homeless. Um, today started today, and they're giving out gift cards. I saw on the news this morning. Giving out gift cards if you participate. Is that the idea? Yes. So they're going. They're counting the homeless and asking them questions starting today. I saw on the news. How and they're giving a gift card to the participants. So every homeless person that answers those questions. So that's, that's I thought probably, about this class. Interesting. And that's, mm -hmm. Today, that's a, a perfect example of, of polling. Now, mm -hmm. since the person can choose to be in it or not be in it, some, you have to understand that sometimes if, if I randomly ask people and everybody answers the question, Nope, nobody's going to pull a gun on me or you know whack me over the head with a baseball bat because I asked them a question. If if it's understood that I can ask you a question, you're going to you know yes or no question. You're going to give me an honest answer. I can say something as simple as "Did you like the movie?" You have three possibilities: yes, no, I didn't see it. <laughs> you're not going to get angry at me. Or, so, anytime you're asking simple questions, you can trust the responses. But if you're allowing people to choose whether they want to answer it or not, that's called self-selecting. Um, does anybody, this is, this is a perfect example because this is one of the most common types of polling and it's not good polling. When you log on to the internet, does anybody ever sometimes see questions in the corner? It'll be some question and it might be something as simple as, you know, did you get your booster shot? Or, you know, do you think Tom Brady should retire? I mean, just, it could be anything. It, has anybody ever seen those kind of questions when you, when you log on and you know, you go, especially if you go to like your MSN homepage, like I have, there'll always be questions. I, I rarely ask, answer them because then it just keeps asking you more questions, but it'll immediately give you feedback and say, this percentage of the people said yes, this percentage said no. And so um, it's very interesting when you're looking at these going, wow, is this how the country feels? No, this is how the people who responded to the question feel. But because you got to choose whether you responded or not, Maybe the majority of the people feel the other way. They just chose not to respond. Does that make sense? Again, that's called self-selecting. It would be similar to me saying, okay, I would like every, we're going to find the class's average weight, how much everyone weighs. And so what you're going to do is write down your weight and we'll, we'll pull them all together. And then we'll find out the class's average weight. Do you think this number is going to be exactly accurate? In no, other words, no, I won't. <laughs> why not? <laughs> Because the, our weights all our weights would just be just dramatically different depending when you ask. Well, to find an average, but the thing is, first of all, you have to know how much you weigh right now, and you have to be honest in your report of how much you weigh. <laughs> Are people always going to be honest when they give their weight? Now, I, I have fun with that because the second one is, what if I ask everyone how tall you are? I think more people are going to write down how tall they want to be. <laughs> If you looked at my driver's license, hey, my driver's license says five foot ten. And I think I reached five foot nine and three quarters was the tallest I ever reached. I've gotten shorter during the pandemic, but my license says five foot ten, so I must be five foot ten. But you know what? I got to write in my own height on my driver's license, just so you know. I got to write in my own weight on my driver's license. 
um, so I could have really put anything I wanted. I could have put six foot three. <laughs> no one was going to check it. So this is one of the problems with polling is you got to be careful. We have fun with it, but you got to be careful that, you know, you know that you can trust the response. Now let's keep going. Now the next one is, I love this one. Um, I'm flipping five coins at one time. I just threw five coins up in there, fair coins. And I, I joke, you know, they're not Harvey Dent coins. Does everyone know what a Harvey Dent coin is? Isn't it like when uh, one side's heavier than the other? Well, sort of. Uh, it, it's from the Batman movie, the, the Joker. Oh, oh, uh, oh, I thought you were talking about, I thought it was Two-Face. Yeah, yeah, Harvey Dent. That was Two-Face. Remember, oh, he, okay. he flips, goes heads or tails, whether he's going to shoot the guy. What's the Harvey Dent coin? It was tails on both sides <laughs> so the harvey dent coin is not a good coin to use because it's it's the same on both sides so we have a fair coin i have i people used to get that result we're getting too far away from the batman movies people forgot but <laughs> the harvey dent coin was not a fair coin right when you're doing the whole coin flip before the football game that's probably not the coin you want to use you want one with the heads on one and the tails on the other so i'm flipping five coins at once it's landing i'm counting the number of tails I did it again. I counted the number of tails. I'm going to do this 200 times. Five coins at one time. I'm counting the number of tails. Is it possible that all five are tails? Is it possible? Yeah. Is it possible that none of them are tails? Yeah. It's probably far more likely to have a mixture of heads and tails. Don't you agree? I mean, it's not very likely that all five are tails. It's not very likely that all five are heads. It's, so when you're looking at the numbers, I did it 200 times. Only six times did I get zero. I, I had a question really quickly. Sorry to sure. intervene, but I think it would be a little bit more helpful if we saw this on the whiteboard. Oh, can you not see it on here? Oh, no, no. Yeah, but like working through it, actually. Oh, OK. No, we, we'll work through it because okay. I also have a key. Remember, I have a key posted, too. So the situation is now one and four are, are a little more likely, but still having four out of five. So there's 29 and 33. And then finally two and three, which are the most likely, right? Two, two tails and three heads or three tails and two heads. These were the outcomes when I did this. So now we want the mean, okay? Now, this is where some people are getting into trouble. The mean is I took, I take every single outcome, all 200 of them. And what do I do? I add them all up. That's what the summation symbol means. Add them all up and divide by what number exactly? What's on the Two. bottom? Two. Two. 200. Because that's how many times we did it. Now, what does this mean? This means I'm going to go zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. Plus zero. Okay, there's six of those. Plus one plus one. Yeah. That's going to take me a really long time if I write down all 200. Do you agree? So let's not yeah. write down all 200. What, what are we going to do? You write one times 29. Yeah, the number one occurred 29 times. So rather than say one plus one 29 times, just multiply one times 29. We've done this before. Okay, that, that's when you have, whoops, hold on a minute. Okay. Oh, here's my erasers. When you have repeated outcomes like we do, the easiest way to do it Right. No one's going to go two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus. Stop me when I hit 66 times, by the way. Two plus two plus two. No, you're going to say 66 twos and you have 61 threes. So we have the sum of the values is going to be I have six zeros plus 29 ones plus 66 twos plus. 61 threes plus 33 fours. And finally, we had five times. Okay. This is the equivalent of me going zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, you know, all the way to six plus six or five, or excuse me, five plus five plus five plus five. Nobody in their right mind is going to sit there and do this 200 times because you're seeing the same values over and over and over and over again. Yeah, Robert. Uh, I just had a quick question regarding. Um... The whole whole exam by itself because my I I didn't I joined a little late because my wife was doing that. Um, the question the question I just quickly had was what 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 uh, notes will or, or I, I have any notes at all during the exam? Well, the, or no? the formulas you can have all all the formulas that we've come up with. Um, the, so we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll point out where those are too. By the way, okay. For example, 
do you really need a formula for mean? Maybe not, but having it written down certainly wouldn't be a bad idea. Do you agree? Just yeah. So, because the formula for variance is a little bit more complicated and I don't want anyone memorizing. I want you to correctly use it. And we're gonna do that in just a moment, by the way. So when I add all this up, I believe it comes out to 510. This plus this plus this. So literally when I added up my zero plus zero plus zero plus one plus one plus one plus two plus two, 200 times, that total was 510, okay? That's, that's what it is. Now, what is my mean? That's the sum of my scores. That's my numerator, okay? So my mean is 510, and you just told me, over 200, over 200, and what does that come out to be exactly? And again, have a cheap calculator at your side so you don't have to do things in your head. 2.5. Um, almost. That would be oh, no. I did the wrong one. My bad. 2.5. 2.55. 2.55, slightly, slightly more than 2.5. Now, common sense question. I'm flipping five coins at once and aren't, aren't heads and tails equally likely? Yes, they are. So when I do this a whole bunch of times, shouldn't I get about the same number of heads and tails? Doesn't that make sense? That I, We talked about this last day. I, I'm expecting I get roughly the same number of heads and tails, you know, because they're fair coins. Well, my average is 2.55 tails, which would mean my average would be 2.45 heads because it adds up to five. Okay, that's almost exactly half. That, that's, a good, that's a good result, right? That's about what we expected. When we did the Monty Hall problem yesterday, you remember how many of you got exactly the correct guesses one third of the time? That, that's like, I couldn't have planned that any more perfectly. That, that doesn't really happen in real life that, that way. But when you guys did it over and over again, many of you got exactly one third of the time you guessed correctly which is what the probability says you were supposed to get, right? Door number one, door number two, door number three, and I'm guessing I got it right one third of the time, most of you can say. And then when we did the later one, you guys, most of you got it right two thirds of the times, which is what you were supposed to see. That's kind of cool that you actually saw evidence. So here we're seeing evidence, hey, about half the time, cool. Now, the next two are the ones that sometimes we get in trouble with, they're not calculations at all. I count to find the next two, the median, and the mode. I have to calculate the mean because I got to add up all the numbers and then divide. If I ranked all of my scores, either from the, or not, I'm sorry, if I, my, my outcomes, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, if I put all the zeros in a row ending it with the fives, or I put all the fives and then ending with the zeros, it doesn't matter. But I want a value where half the outcomes were above, half the outcomes were below. So now I only have to look at the frequency. So I'm going to write it out for you. This is what it says on the sheet. And, th and this is to find the median, correct? This is to find the median. Well, this will also be to find the mode. Okay. Let's do, you know what? The easiest of all calculations is, or the, it's not a calculation. The easiest is always the mode. Because I'm looking for the highest frequency. What's the highest frequency you see? 66. 66. 66 isn't the mode. 66 is how many times the mode occurred. The mode is two. two. The outcome with the highest frequency, that's the definition of the mode. Did you have to do any work? or Did you even have to count anything? No. Nah, you said, which one happened the most often? Now, think of it another way. Let, let's totally, I have six people running for office. You have candidate zero. I would never want to be candidate zero, by the way. But you have candidate zero, candidate one, candidate two, candidate three, candidate four, and candidate five. Then frequency, frequency would be the number of votes they got. Who got the most votes? Not candidate 66. No, candidate two got 66 votes. See, all elections, anytime you're voting, it's always the mode. What got the most votes? That's what wins. You don't say the, the number of votes won. You say who or what thing got the most votes. So in this case, you can say the number two got the most votes. Okay, so that's the mode. Does everybody, everybody cool with that? Mode is supposed to be easy. I, I, keep, I keep trying to find the mean, and I keep getting 501 for whatever reason. 501? Did anybody else get a different number? I got the same thing. You got 510 so I was or like confused. I was like, wait a second. Yeah, did I, do yeah. My math I, I've, I did it like five times just Oh, now. you know what? 
Oh, you know what? Hold on, man. Oh, my goodness. No, you know what? <laughs> so I was like, am no, I completely no, 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 lost? No, no. Here's, here's the problem. I'm looking at my key. <laughs> you see this? I'm looking at the key online that I printed, but I, I had changed something about the problem. Oh, I had, I had changed a number on the problem. I, I changed my the original problem I put, I decided to change because I wanted different answers on the key. Oh my goodness. So you're right. That uh, let me let's do this again. If you look at the key, it's not I have a different I'm, I'm so sorry to keep interjecting. It's just no, 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 no. That's my crazy. <laughs> no, I think I'm crazy. Um if you if you guys look at the key, I have a different set of frequencies. I, I had changed the problem. This this is not a common thing, but I this happens sometimes in class. I have Windows 8, so I split the screen. When I'm writing the key, you know, I, I have I always do this on quizzes and tests, and I write the key. And sometimes I go, you know, I don't like that answer. I'm gonna change the question. But then I gotta remember to copy the change onto the original. And I don't always do that. So sometimes even in my calculus classes, I'll get an email saying, uh, Mr. Brown, the key has a different problem than the quiz did. And I'll go, oh no, not again. I don't do it, not very often, but it does happen. And everybody's confused because they're looking at the key going, well, it's the same type of problem. It's just not the same values. I had changed the problem on the key. The key is perfect for that question, <laughs> but let's, let's make it perfect for this question. All right, so I'm gonna do it right here. So zero times six plus one times 29 plus two times 66 plus three times 61 plus four times 33 plus five times five equals, and you are correct, that is 501. Now, my key has a really cool question too, by the way. It's just not the same as this one. So this is 501. So what does that do to our mean? It changes it to what? 2.505. 2.505. It's still barely more than half the time I get tails. Okay, cool. Um, my... Now, the median and the mode. The mode's still going to be two. That didn't change. Now, to find the median, the easiest way to do it, I want a number where basically half the values are on one side, half the values are on the other. It means I want the middlemost outcome. Well, it's hard to know when I'm looking at this because I have to look at the frequencies. So let's count up the frequencies. Remember, there's 200 altogether. Okay? So right now, I'm going to show you. Right here, that's 35 outcomes. Does everyone see that? And if I throw the 66, that's 101 outcomes right there. Look on the other side. 61 plus 33 plus 5, that adds up to 99 outcomes. So let's just say we're numbering it from lowest to highest. There are 200 values. Do you agree that the 100th highest value and the 101st highest value are both the number two? Or I should say the lowest value. So if I start, if I'm listing them, zero, 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 you know, dot, 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 one, 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 dot, 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 eventually two, 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 three, 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 three. The first hundred values are zero, one, and two, and the 101st value is also a two. I have 200 values. So it's the value that's between the 100 and the 101st but both of those values are the number two. Therefore, what's the median? Two. What if? What if exactly half the values were two or less and exactly half the values were three or more? Then what would the median be? If uh, half- Five? It'd be 2.5 because exactly half were on one side, half were on the other. That's when I take the average. But the, the median in this case is the number two because it's both the 100 and the 101st value. Now the 102nd value is a three. Okay, so for the number two, I have 100 values. I have basically the same number on both sides. So the mean, median, and mode are rarely going to be the same number. Now, they're probably all fairly close together, but they're usually not going to be the same number, not necessarily. Okay, so mode by far the easiest. Mean, I actually need a calculator. Median, I just simply count and say, where's the middlemost value? <clears throat> if all of my values are different, 
sometimes, you know, if, if, if I had a string of 200 completely different numbers, I need them ordered. And then I'd have to find where the middle was. That's actually more work. This is a little simpler because I could just count the frequencies. Now the variance, that's the one that gives us the most trouble from a standpoint of calculation because it has a little bit more in the calculation sense. So what the variance is, okay, the formal definition of variance, I have to take zero minus this, square it, and then add up those things up 200 times. Every number minus that, then square it, then add them up. That's my numerator. But I showed you a shortcut. A shortcut is the sum of the squares. If I square each number and then add them up, I subtract the number, which in this case is 200. That's the, the, the n is always how many times, minus the square of the mean. So I know that number, I know that number, and I got to calculate that number. And then overall, n minus one. That's the variance. The only number I still have to calculate is that one. Okay. But because I have repeats, it makes it kind of easy. Anytime you have repeats, that part is easier. So I'm going to write this part down. N minus one would be 199. That was 200 times the square of that number. Now I still need, I got to figure out what's that number there. That's the only one I got to calculate. So that is zero squared plus zero squared plus zero squared six times, plus one squared plus one squared plus one squared 29 times, or just simply square it and multiply. It. Well, zero squared times six, that's zero. One squared times 29 plus two squared times 66 plus three squared times 61 plus four squared times 33 plus five squared times five. So again, if I write it out, zero squared times six plus one squared times 29 plus two squared times 66 plus three squared times 61 plus four squared times 33, squeeze this in plus five squared times five. That's the sum of the squared scores. My 200 scores, I square each score and I add them up. But because of the repeats, that's pretty fast actually. And that number I got was 1,495 and I'm going to do it a second time. The reason is, I can't, I'm not going to do that in my head. It's too much work. But because I'm completely relying on this guy here, is it possible my fat fingers hit a wrong button? Is it humanly possible? Well, if you've ever gotten a text from me, then you know it's very possible. In fact, it happens pretty often. <laughs> my fat thumbs, I have fun with this all the time, but I, I will be sending a text and go, no, I, I, that's not, no, that's not the word I just asked. No, why can't my phone spell things correctly. Why does it keep changing all the letters on me? Well, it's because my fat thumbs hit an adjacent letter. So let's do this again. Double check. Because this is not a long process in this case, and I got the same number. Beautiful. This is the variance. So let's do this on our calculator. Because I have stuff going on on the top, Probably the easiest way to do this and ensure that you don't mess it up is do the entire numerator and hit equals. Do the entire numerator, hit equals, then divide it by 199. The other way of doing it is use parentheses around your numerator. Okay, so if I do the whole numerator, 1495 minus 200 times 2.505, I hit my square button. When I do that, I don't need you to write down that number, but I'm going to tell you what that number is. I'm running out of room here. Just so we all have the same thing. Right now, my calculator says 239.995 on top. Okay. And that's a good thing to double check on your own. You can do that later if you want. I did this on top but I need to divide it by 199. So divided by 199, and that gives me approximately, 
I'm running out of room here. I'm going to all erase the top part now. So my variance, which is this number here, my variance is approximately, and the, the mathematical symbol is actually an equal with a dot because I got to round it off. It looks like it's about 1.206. So hopefully you all got something like that. Okay. Now, I've got that value. But it's not really the variance that we use in calculations. It's something called the standard deviation. Can anybody tell me what the standard deviation is in relation to the variance? Anybody try that one? That's the variance. Uh, Professor, I'm so confused. How'd you go? How'd you go? 1.206. Just did that. Two, is it two? Is it, I can't. Is it two thirty nine times one ninety five divided by one ninety nine? No, my numerator is. I, I said go ahead, to make your life easier. Just go ahead and calculate the numerator first. And that's two hundred and thirty nine point nine nine five, and then oh, divided oh, by one oh, one ninety nine. I, I I thought I thought it was two thirty nine times nine nine. Okay, my, my, my. no, that's a decimal. I, yeah, <laughs> that's a decimal. Yeah, just that. By the way, you don't have to do that. Just this is really simple on any calculator. But if you are not sure if you're getting your parentheses right and stuff, you can always just do the numerator and then divide it. That's always a safe way to do it. Or just hit, hit this equals divided by this or parentheses around this divided. Either way, you're getting this. That's the variance, but that's not the number we use in calculation. The number we use in calculations is the standard deviation. How do I go from variance to standard deviation? If the variance is S squared, the standard deviation is S. So how do I get that? How do you go from S squared to S? Then we try that one. I mean, you guys turned in it's, quizzes where you all did, right? It's just the square root of the square root. your deviance. Yeah. So the, the number on my screen, 1.206, yada, yada, yada. That's the variance. I now need to take the square root of that number. So I just hit, on my calculator, I hit square root, answer, equals. I don't re-enter the number. I just hit the square root button on my, on my screen. The square root of this is approximately 1.098. And it's got a lot of decimal points. Would you, would you round up at the fourth place or? Well, it, it depends how many decimals you want to report. OK, OK. Yeah, by the way, the, it is never wrong to report lots of decimals. You just went around correctly. I, I just reported three places, zero, nine, eight. If I had gone one more place, it would have been a two, wouldn't it? Because of the rounding. But that's that's more than, that's overkill. That's enough. And you, and you got that by square rooting- um, The screen. 1.206? You just hit the square root. Yeah, don't, don't re-enter it. Just hit the square what? root button. This one gave me the, the most difficulty in the quiz. Every time I, I pressed it, it would just give me something completely different. Well, we calculated this value, so it's on the screen. I'm not going to touch it. It's on the screen. If I then hit the square root symbol, my my calculator in the bottom left, I don't or bottom right, the bottom right corner. I don't know if you can see it. Whoops, hold on. Can you see my calculator in the bottom right? I'm not showing up. You see the A N S. That's called mm -hmm. the answer key. It's right next to the equals. Whenever you hit the answer key, it's whatever's on your screen. You never have to re-enter that thing. It's one of the most convenient keys on a calculator. When I have a whole screen of decimals, the last thing I want to do is erase it and then re-enter it. That's, that's too much work. The answer key is whatever that number is. I want the square root of what's on my screen. So I just hit square root. And then answer. Now, another thing you can try is that you can go square root equals, and that will also work. So when you have the 1.2 on your screen, if you hit the square root button and then hit equals, it will also work. So you'll know because you got this number back again. Now, what the standard deviation is, it's kind of the average distance that everything is from the middle. So we talked about this 
the reason the standard deviation is so important, the standard deviation is a simple number that tells you how far things are spread out. If a standard deviation is big, things are really spread out. If the standard deviation is small, things are tightly clustered. So on an exam, for example, if the standard deviation is small, you could be very far from the middle. If the standard deviation is large, you're probably not very far from the middle. And the number that measures how far away we are from the middle is called the Z-score. Okay, now we talked about that. That's been a couple of weeks. The Z-score, let me erase this now. The Z-score is a number that says, how far away are you from the mean, good or bad? The Z-score is your score minus the mean over the standard deviation. So if you have a z-score of one, that means you're exactly one standard deviation above average. If your z-score is negative one, then you're one standard deviation below average and so on. We talked about standardized scores like SATs and things like that. Those are all measured with z-scores. So On an SAT, what they do is they say, we're gonna call the standard deviation 100. So a score of 500 is the mean. If you're one standard deviation above the mean, you have a 600. If you're one standard deviation below the mean, you're a 400. So when you hear about somebody, you know, some super smart kid getting an 800, you know, on their SAT in math or English, that means they're three standard deviations. They're 300 where 100 is the standard deviation in that case. That means they have a Z-score of three, which is, wow, that means you're really far. It's very difficult to be three standard deviations away. It just really is if, if you... Once we study that kind of stuff. So the question here is zero, zero tails, four tails. I want to calculate their z-scores. Remember, my mean was just a little over 2.5. That means this four should have a positive z-score because it's above average. Zero should have a negative z-score because it's below average, right? Positive z-score means you're above the mean. Negative z-score means you're below the mean. That's why I always laugh when people say, I have, a, I have a group of people and everybody was above average. Well, that's not mathematically possible. <laughs> hey, what's the average of everybody's above average, right? It should be about half the people are above average and about half the people are below average. Otherwise, it's not an average. So let's calculate the z-score for those two things. Hold on one second. All right. Put that phone off. So we have, a Z, I said the Z-score for a score of zero. So zero, my Z-score is zero minus the mean, we said that was 2505, divided by the standard deviation. And let's see what that gives us. Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, you typically report two decimals for a Z-score. That's kind of a universal thing. It is never wrong to report more you just never need to report more, okay? So we'll report this as a two decimal place value. And I get on my calculator, this is approximately negative 2.28. So for the outcome of zero tails, since zero minus the mean divided by the standard deviation is about negative 2.28. So hopefully we're all getting the same number on our calculators. Now the next calculation I said, let's calculate the standard, excuse me, the z-score for four tails, okay? You don't have to do any thinking at this point. You just, it's just plug in the numbers. So this, the z-score, let me write it here. For the number four, the z-score is four minus 2.505, I use the same mean, divided by 1.098, I'm using the same standard deviation, and now we expect a positive number. So four minus. I got 1.7 D2. For, for this one? Yeah, 1.72. Uh, it's a little big. Try to get four minus 2.505. Where, 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 do, where do we get the four from? That that's was the question. Oh, it's just... that's the outcome. <laughs> I'm saying that find the Z score for an outcome of four. 
So four minus the mean divided by a standard deviation. The previous problem was find it for the outcome of zero. So zero minus the mean. Um, does anybody get a different number? It's positive. It should be about. Okay, now I got 1.36. Yeah, that's what it should get. About 1.36. Now, it, it's hard to give meaning to a z-score because we haven't worked with them a lot. But it'd be kind of like this. If you were in a classroom and the teacher told everybody their z-scores rather than their actual scores, <laughs> that'd be kind of weird, I know. But if I said, oh, Andrea, you got 1.36 as your z-score. Rosalind, you got 1.72. And Salvador, you got 0 0.98. And you go, OK, I guess that's good. Um, <laughs> do you remember what I said before? I said, generally speaking, at least 2 thirds of all the outcomes are within one standard deviation, plus or minus. So between a negative one and one, usually at least two thirds of all the outcomes are gonna be within one. So if you're more than one standard deviation above the mean, your Z-score is bigger than one, that means you scored really high. About at least 95% of all outcomes are within two standard deviations, either above or below. So if you, if you took a large group of people 95% or more of all of the outcomes are gonna be within two standard deviations. So having a Z-score bigger than two means you are really far above. You're probably the highest score. And it's like 99.99 is within three. I mean, that's extremely rare to be that far away, okay? So a Z-score, again, says how many standard deviations above or below the mean I am. Right now, we're not gonna give it a lot of meaning because we haven't really worked with it that much. But the calculation is actually quite simple. Score minus mean divided by standard deviation. But that means I have to correctly calculate the mean and the standard deviation. If either one of those calculations is incorrect, well, then I'm in serious trouble, aren't I? All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna roll some dice. On the exam, by the way, I'm going to give you the dice roll chart. So you don't, I don't want you to make a dice roll chart. I'm just gonna write down, you know, the one, 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 two, one, three. So you can just you can cross it up, calculate it all over the place, just do simple things. So I'm going to make a real fast one right now. I can do this quickly. Uh, Professor, I had a quick question. Yes, yes, ask. Uh, for the 4 minus 2.505 divided by the 1.098, I keep getting a, a different answer. Um, I'm not sure if I'm putting it in wrong, but I keep Either getting one you you have to, One of two things. Either you have to put parentheses on the top, or do the top hit equals and then hit divided by. Mr. Brown? Yes. I'm gonna time you for the, the rice, the, the dice roll. Oh, not yet though, <laughs> not yet. Okay, so Robert, here's the question. When I'm doing this on my calculator, I cannot do this. Because that means I divided the B by C only. I've got to do either this or do A minus B hit equals, then hit divided by C. So either I have to put parentheses around my whole numerator or just hit equals after I'm done and then do divided by. Yeah, I just. Like, yeah, I will absolutely all calculators and all computers on planet Earth will give the wrong answer 100% of the time if I don't do one of these. Because I if, I do A, if I do A minus B over C, then I'm really doing A minus B over C. I don't want that. I want that. So I got to tell my calculator to do that as my numerator or just finish my numerator and then divide one or the other. Doesn't matter. But you got to be one or the other. So if you're do it until you get the right number and they say, ah, oh, that's the order of things I have to enter because that's important. It's one thing to say, I have the right formula, I have all the right numbers, but I'm not getting the right answer because that's how we're entering it into the calculator. And I don't want to make a mistake there because that will, that will be a kind of a killer, kind of a buzz kill, you know? All right. Okay, you can go ahead and time me now. Okay. Now. 26 seconds. 
oh man, I'm, I'm slowing down in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> See, during the Olympic trials, I was able to get this in like 23.5 seconds. And I kept, you know, having to go against the Norwegian team and the, in the Scandinavians and, you know, or maybe that was when I was doing the, the head first thing, by the way, did any of you guys watch the Olympics? I, I have fun watching Olympics because of some of the silliness, but they're allowing too many crazy people in now. Did crazy? anybody watch mean? the skeleton? I don't, that's where you, you take a little, look like a, a cookie sheet, you know, something you make chocolate chip cookies on, put little tiny rails under it and then have a person lie down on this thing face first with their nose about three inches off the ground and they go 80 miles an hour down this thing. Did anybody, did anybody watch that? That is the most insane, crazy thing I've ever seen. 80 miles an hour going head first where you're lying on something that doesn't even, half your body isn't even on it. So your feet are hitting the ground and your nose is only a couple inches off the ground. I'm thinking, you know, if you wipe out, that probably isn't going to end well. I mean... I guess nerves of steel, or you have to be completely insane. I don't know, or both. But I, I'm watching this going, this is an Olympic event. I think if they saw somebody doing this down the street, they'd, they'd call in the crew, you know, thinking that they were, you know, like jumping off a bridge or something. I mean, it's, it's just not a, I don't, not a wise way to spend your day, you know, going 80 miles an hour head first with your head up, barely off the ground. And yeah, anyway, so that's, that's just my, my opinion. Now, I'm going to roll the dice. All right. I'm going to roll the dice one time. My first question is, find the probability that doubles are rolled. Now, remember, there are 36 dice rolls. So the probability every time you ask the question is usually going to be 36, isn't it? The denominator, I mean. So doubles. What are doubles? Doubles are these guys, aren't they? So what's the probability that somebody rolls doubles? Well, how many ways can I roll doubles? One, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six. So that's six ways. So the answer is 636. That's it. Um, should you reduce this? Yeah. Generally speaking, if your probability is always a fraction, if you can reduce it, reduce it. If you have a calculator that has a fraction key, it will, it will reduce it for you. It's just easy to do. Always easier to work with smaller numbers than bigger numbers. So if I have a ginormous numerator and a ginormous denominator, and maybe it reduced all the way down to one half, oh, I'd rather say one half. Much easier to work with, much easier to, to understand. So that's the first question. Well, that was pretty easy. So the second question is, find the probability that a multiple of four or six is rolled. Now, you don't even have to do a calculation. You can simply count them. Multiple of four or six. Tell me, what are the multiples of four what are the multiples of six? Multiple of four would be four, eight, 12, correct? Those are multiples of four? My total is a multiple of four. Can you roll higher than a 12 when you roll the dice? Are there any 13s or 14s? <laughs> nah, right, boxcars, six, six is the biggest you can do. So. A, a sum of four, eight, or 12. Those are multiples of four. What are the multiples of six? Six or 12? Wait a minute, I counted 12 twice, didn't I? Oh, if I'm not careful, I don't want to count 12 twice. So there's two ways I can do this. I can count all these, count all these, and then subtract, or I can just go through it. Now, I want the outcomes of four, eight, six, 12. So which ones add up to four? Oops. Now, there's something off to the side that I'm going to do that we did in class. We've done it a couple of times. And that's the actual probabilities. This might be easier to think of it this way. Okay, if my sum is a two or a three or a four or a five or a six, a seven, an eight, a nine, 10, Am I going off the edge here? Yeah, hold on. <laughs> I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to fit all these on here. I want a little smaller. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Well, I know this is one out of 36, and I know this one's one out of 36. I know this one is two out of 36, and I know this one is two out of 36. There's an easy way to do it. This is three out of 36. 
Oh my goodness, so is this. And this one is four out of 36, and so is this one. This is five out of 36, and so is this one. And the king of the hill, of course, is the seven. And we know that's six out of 36. And all of those add up to one, 36 out of 36. So the question was, what's the probability of rolling a multiple of four or a multiple of six? Which means I want that, 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 and that. Does that look, sense? Does that look correct to you guys? So how do I answer this question? Just add those four numbers up. That's it. That's all I got to do. So what have I got? I got three out of 36. I've got five out of 36. I've got five out of 36. I've got one out of 36. What does that add up to? 14 out of 36. So the answer to the question is 14 out of 36, which I can reduce again. It's just, it's good form to reduce if you can, smaller numbers, and that's it. Now, if I said, well, what's the probability of rolling a multiple of four? You would have said four, eight, 12, and add those up. If I said, what's the probability of rolling a multiple of six? You'd have said, oh, six or a 12, I'll add those up. So now if I said either one, you'd say, wait a minute, I can't add that sum to that sum because I double counted. So do you remember what we did in class? In that case, you would have subtracted out the overlap. And that would have given you the same 14 out of 36 in the end. And that's it. So you don't have to do anything clever. You can just simply count them because there's not that many. Now, the last question is the trickiest one. This is the conditional probability. We talked about this at great length yesterday in class. Conditional probability is if I have, I, I always call it insider information, you know, like stock exchange. The probability of something happening is whatever it is, but I have inside information that could affect that. And the example I use was in sports. You know, you, they'll be betting on particular games or particular outcomes, but maybe a star player on one of the teams, you find out it's injured. Ooh, might that affect the outcome of the game? If, you know, if the best player out there, right? So I'll give you a simple example. The day before this last Super Bowl, do you know who, who the favorite for next year's Super Bowl was? Does anybody know who the favorite for next year's Super Bowl was the day before this year's Super Bowl was played? Tampa Bay Buccaneers again. Did you know that? Now, a couple of days after the Super Bowl, what happened? Tom Brady announced his retirement. <laughs> what did that do to, to Tampa Bay being a favorite for next year's Super Bowl? Do you think that's still the case? I'm pretty sure most people are going to have them probably not very good because if you knew that Tom Brady wasn't going to play, you probably wouldn't be betting on Tampa Bay to go to the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> so the idea of insider information. So I'm going to roll the dice and I want to know what's the probability that the sum is at least a nine. So let's look at the picture. A sum of at least nine would be nine or 10 or 11 or 12. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna box off that portion. There we go. These are all of the outcomes where the sum is at least nine. It's nine, 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 10, 10, 10, 10 11, 11, 12. There are a lot of outcomes. So if I simply ask the question, what is the probability that the sum is at least a nine? There are 10 outcomes. So you would say 10 out of 36, agreed? Does, it, does everyone agree with that? It'd just be 10 out of 36. Yes. But, but I threw something at you. I said, oh, while I was rolling the dice, right? Andrea was asking me a question and she distracted me. And one of the dice slipped out of my hand prematurely. And Rosalind saw that one of the dice landed a five. And then I continued rolling the dice. But she has the strange ability. She, she's an Avenger, you guys know that. She can freeze time momentarily. So one of my dice landed a five and all of us did the freeze frame. So she quickly calculated the probability knowing that one of the dice landed a five. You see, if one of the dice lands a five, is the outcome of six, six now a possible outcome? Or six, four, or four, six? No. Right now, before we do anything, my sample space is 36 rolls. But if you saw one of the dice land at a five, the sample space is no longer 36 rolls. It's only the rolls that have fives in them. 
Does that make sense? Oh, ah, so what did I just do? So when Rosalind saw that die landed a five and she was able to stop time, not forever, just for a couple of, actually we wouldn't know because we've been frozen in time. She might've stopped time for 10 years. We, we don't even know. All we know is we didn't age. That's, that's cool. Okay. So if I said, what roles are we actually considering? Does everyone see that we're only considering these? There's only 11 roles that have fives in them. Oh, I've just, when you have insider information, you are changing the sample space because I don't have 36 possible dice rolls anymore. I only have the ones with fives. Now of those roles, which ones have sums of at least nine? Well, let's see. Still that one, still that one, still that one, still that one, still that one. So I have one, two, three, four, five. There are five roles that have a five in them, or excuse me, there, there are five of the five of those roles add up to at least nine, but there were only 11 roles to consider. So my answer therefore is five over 11. And here's why that's a big deal. When I said the first time, how many of the roles have a sum of at least nine? We said, well, 10 out of 36. 10 out of 36 is not a very big number. In fact, as a decimal, 10 out of 36, is only 0 0.2777, only a little more than a fourth. But when I gave you that, that insider information that, hey, you know one of the dice is a five, it changed to five over 11. Five over 11 is 0.4545. That is significantly larger, significantly larger. Okay, so if you were a basketball player, the first one you'd say is roughly 27% of the time you're making your three pointers. The other one is you're roughly making them 45% of the time. 45% is way more than 27%. Ah, so the insider information definitely changed things. So that's why if you have the dice roll chart, you can just hack away at it. You don't really have to calculate, you just have to count. Okay, that's it, that's a good thing. All right, now the last sequences of questions, these are the with and without replacement kind, or I should say the next sequence. Now, do you remember what it means with or without replacement? So I, I'm doing my magic trick. You know, I, I, I splay all the cards out and I, and I say, all right, Salvador, pick a card, any card. And then you pick the card and look at it. One of two things. You either put it back in the deck or you set it down. Do you understand? It's one or, it's one or the other. With replacement means you're putting it back in the deck and then reshuffling it. Without replacement means you're setting it down and now I have less cards in my hand. Both are valid, but I have to know which one it is because it clearly affects the probability. We had a quiz recently where I said you had marbles in a bin, right? Red and blue marbles. And almost everybody who attempted the question did it perfectly. It wasn't complicated, but you took into account, oh, if I'm doing it without replacement, then my next selection, I have less marbles. And I have to take that into account, okay? Um, it's a side note, but this is the same mathematics. Does anybody know what card counting is and what that, what that refers to, the term card counting? If you're a gambler, particularly it's, blackjack. <laughs> isn't, it, it's an, it's an, isn't it an illegal thing, right? And, and... Well, okay, that, that's, the casino views it as cheating, absolutely, and they will deal with it extremely harshly if they suspect you're doing it. But to say it's illegal, are you breaking a law? Is there a law against it? You don't, I don't know. It is cheating because you're trying to gain an advantage that somebody else doesn't have. But you could also say it's just really good strategy. The notion of card counting is simple. As cards are getting played, they're not being reused. They're set aside. And then I play the next round and the next round. If you're absolutely alert and aware of the cards that are being played, then those cards are not available in the next round. So that's playing without replacement. The difference is in a casino, they don't play with one deck of cards. They'll have several decks of cards at one time. So they won't run out of cards quickly. And what they do is they don't exhaust all the cards. They might have 10 decks of cards. And when they're about halfway through, they'll stop and reshuffle them. So if you're, even if you could keep track, you don't gain a huge advantage because they're using so many decks. But let's suppose we were playing a game and we were using exactly one deck of cards and you just saw, you know, three aces being played. Now, you know, there's only one ace left. 
does that change probabilities if you know there's only one left? Yes, of course it does. You see, that's the idea of, of having insider information. Well, with replacement, without replacement is another way of saying that. So let's look at this problem. Professor? Yes, go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, so yeah. I'm looking at the formula uh, sheet under probability. Um, so the insider information, is that the same thing as saying conditional that probability? Is, conditional, exactly. is that the that, same thing? Yeah. Okay. The reason I like to say insider information, because then we kind of have a notion, oh, there's a question to be asked, but I know something that maybe somebody else doesn't know. And right. that can clearly affect the answer. Okay. You know, it's like saying, I'm going to well, get really silly. I'm going to flip a coin. What's the probability that I flip a tail? So you go, well, one half. Oh, but you know for a fact that I'm using a Harvey Dent coin. <laughs> now the probability is one. <laughs> it's a, right? <laughs> that, that's, we have some fun with that. I'm going to pick one name of a student out of a hat for the class, but you know I'm only going to pick a woman. So then the probability of Salvador is now zero. <laughs> Whereas before it was, it was maybe one out of 15 or something. But if you knew I was going to choose a woman, then you'd say the probability I pick Salvador is zero. Oh, okay. Because that insider information changed things. What did it change? Mainly the sample space. Only women were being chosen. And so therefore he can't be chosen. If you said, I, you knew I was going to pick somebody of a particular age group. Now you say, well, who in the classes of that age group? They're the only people that could be chosen then. Again, changing the sample space. That's, that's the insider information. You know this. Now, in real life, this happens all the time. That, that we know something, it can change the probability. And I use sports as an example. Um, I used this last day. The Lakers are playing the Clippers tonight. Go Lakers. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to bet on the game. But what if you found out, again, right before you placed your bet, you found out LeBron James wasn't going to play. Would that affect every gambler's bet at that point? Of course it would. Best player on the planet. He's not going to play. I'm pretty sure that's going to have a serious outcome on the game. What if you found out that half the Clippers just tested positive for COVID right before the game? <laughs> By the way, th this has happened in both hockey and basketball. They've postponed games this year because of a significant number of players testing positive. But what if only a few tested positive and they still play the game? Would that be a huge disadvantage for the Clippers? Of course it would. Having that knowledge before you placed your bet would have a huge effect on your bet itself. That's what conditional probability is all about. If I know a little bit, it can affect. I'm not saying it will. What if you said, okay, the Lakers are playing the Clippers tonight and you had eggs for breakfast. You know, I, I, I don't think that's gonna affect the probability of the outcome. <laughs> Even though I know you had eggs for breakfast, I, I, I'm thinking that's not gonna have any effect. <laughs> so not all insider information is, well, useful, okay? So in this case here, I'm making it real simple. In a deck of 52 cards, we know that half of them are red, half of them are black, okay? And I'm gonna say, you're gonna pull out two cards with replacement, okay? With replacement. So it means you look at the card, put it back, shuffle them again, look at the card, What's the probability of they're both red? Well, the probability you chose a red card in the first place clearly would be 26 over 52, which is a half, of course. But because you're putting the card back in, what's the probability you choose a red card again? Exactly the same. Does everyone agree with that? Because I still have 52 cards and there's still 26 red ones. So technically that's a half times a half. So my answer is simply a fourth. If I use a calculator, it will reduce it to a fourth. Now, let me ask you a different question, okay? Slightly different question. What if I said, same thing, I'm gonna pull out two cards, but I'm gonna do it without replacement. So the probability the first card was red was still 26 over 52, but I'm gonna keep that card and set it aside. Now what's the probability the next card is red? And five out of 21? Out of? 51. 51, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Does everyone understand why? I have one less card and I have one less red card. So if I kept going, these numbers keep decreasing, don't they? Oh, so with replacement, without replacement, 
it's not complicated, but I have to keep track of, okay, am I putting it back or am I not? Because it's going to change the probability. Now, the next one says I do three cards. Now, a face card, you don't have to be a, a card player. A face card is a jack, a queen, or a king. And there's four of everything because there's four suits, there's four twos, there's four threes, there's four fours, and so on. There's four jacks, there's four queens, there's four kings. So there are 12 face cards in a deck of cards. There's four jacks, four kings, four queens. So I'm going to do three face cards in a row. So I just said there are 12, there we go. There are 12 face cards. Face, you know, face cards are good. I have 12 face cards. So the probability that I choose a face card is this. Now, I want to choose another face card, but I said without replacement. So you pick the face card and you set it down. So what's the probability the next one's a face card? 11 out of 51. Beautiful. And now I want you to do it one more time. I'm going to set that one down. 10 out of 50. 10 out of 50. And there's my answer. Now, a lot of people will make this harder than they have to. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out my calculator, but I'm going to use the fraction key, which is in the upper left. And it looks like it looks like a fraction. <laughs> and I'm going to enter 12 fraction key 52 times 11 fraction key 51 times 10 fraction key 50. I'm just going to enter it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just entering it equals. And my calculator says the reduced fraction is 11 over 1105. Calculator went ahead and reduced it for me. I don't want to do that by hand. Too much work. That is a really small number, by the way. That is a really small number. If I now want that as a decimal, I'll just enter 11 over 11.05. Wow. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit less than 1%. Whoa. So the probability of doing three face cards in a row without replacement is really small. That's not very likely. Okay. Wow. Now. Two questions. I have yeah. two questions. How did you get that as a decimal on the calculator? Oh, I just, I just entered it. I just, I just re-entered it like that. And it's supposed to give you a decimal? Well, if I say 11 divided by 11.05, it'll give me a decimal. Yeah. Okay. And then my other question was, the only reason why you have three fractions up there and you're multiplying them is because it asked for three, right? If it, was to, ask, it three times. Right. if it was to ask for 12, you would do all of them? Well, if, if you said, I would have picked 12 cards in a row, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would keep doing this and they keep getting smaller. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I have a, I have a, your time is running out. Time is running out. And the question is, you're going to look and you're going to do this without replacement. You're going to do it 20 times in a row without replacement. What's the, what's the probability of getting 20 consecutive face cards without replacement? Zero. Why? Because after the first 12 terms, there aren't any face cards left. <laughs> so it'd be zero, wouldn't it? You can't do it 20 times because there's only 12 face cards. So that might be a silly question. You go, oh, without replacement means I'm going to run out if I do it long enough. Ooh. So I just kept going, kept going, kept going. I would eventually run out. And now it won't give me one. That's an interesting thought. Okay. Now, you're going to flip a coin. Now, there's a fair coin. You're going to flip a coin. We know that it's two times two times two times two as the number of times. I'm going to flip the coin 10 times. Can anybody tell me the number of possible outcomes? And when I say outcome, I mean sequences of heads and tails. So, you know, one sequence might be you flip the coin 10 times. So you got heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, heads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Tails, tails. Okay, there's a sequence of 10 coin flips. Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> 10 coins, I can't count. That, that would be an example of a sequence of 10 coin flips. Exactly how many of these are there? If it's two times two times two, how many? It'd be two raised to the 10th power. Okay. Do that on my calculator. That's 1,024. If I ask you to flip a coin 10 times, how many possible outcomes are there? There's 1,024 different you know, head tail sequences. Wow. Okay. How many of those will all 10 flips be heads? 
only one. So what's the probability? One divided by 1,024. That's it. Oh, okay. That was easy. Now, the next question. We talked about the probability of at least one. I, this is one of my favorite probabilities. And I, I use this with the slot machine. Um, I ask a question in other math classes about um, getting struck by lightning. Did I ask you guys that question? I can't remember. It's a great question. What's the probability at least one person is going to be struck by lightning? And you'd say, well, it's going to be really small. No, actually, it's really large. <laughs> at least one doesn't mean everybody. So we say, well, what's the probability of none? And then subtract that from one. Oh, remember, at least one, what's the only thing left? None. I just said, what's the probability of 10 heads? Isn't that the same as saying zero tails? Is 10 heads the same as zero tails? Tell me, what do you think? 10, on 10 flips, is 10 heads the same as zero tails? Yes. So what's the probability of zero tails? Well, the same thing. The probability of zero tails is this. Okay, I can have zero tails or one or two or three or four or five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's only this probability of getting zero tails. So what's the probability of getting at least one? That, that's it. Remember, the at least one is one minus the probability of none. I love that. So what's the probability of at least one? 1,023 over 1,024. That's... That's a really large probability. <laughs> so I'm going to have you flip a coin 10 times. It's pretty good chance you're going to get at least one tail. You agree? Because there's only one out of 1,024 that you're going to get no tails. 1,023 out of 1,024 that you're going to get one or two or three or four or five, six, seven, eight, or nine or 10. So that, that one's, that's kind of cool. Okay. Any question on this? All right, um, I'm going to give you a bonus problem, a bonus question. Hold on. I was doing this experiment earlier because I do stuff like this in other math classes too. They, a lot of math classes spend um, like Math 245, which is a really high level class, discrete mathematics. They do a lot of probability and stuff. So I'm going to hold on. You were the share screen. Let me go back to. Oh, I'm going to pin myself. There we go. All right. Um, here's, here's what I did. I am going to take a die, a single die, and we've been practicing stuff like this in class, and I'm going to roll it and just keep track of the outcomes. Okay? So fairly simple motion. So my outcomes are one or two or three or four or five or six. It's a die. Now, I'm going to do this a whole bunch of times. And by the way, one of the reasons you sometimes do experiments like this a lot of times is because so maybe Andrea and Salvador were playing a dice game and Salvador was a little suspicion going you know those dice seem to land a certain way way more often than I'm thinking they should that'd be kind of like saying we're flipping coins and it seems to be heads way more than tails that's mathematically possible but it would it make you a little suspicious that maybe it's not a fair coin or if the die is landing one way more than other ways you know, every time I roll the die, it lands a six. <laughs> every time, I'd be a little suspicious. Might be a Harvey Dent die, right? All, all the sides are six. So one way you can actually do this is with experimentation. You can do an experiment like this a lot of times and say, how likely would a fair die be that extreme? You, there's math that does this. It's kind of fun. We're not going to do that right now. So I did this a whole bunch of times. Okay. These are the outcomes. I'm going to write the frequency underneath them. So let's say that the one happened, you know, eight times, and the two, um, 26, and the three, um, nine times, and the four, let's see, 16 times, and we'll say the five happened 11 times, um, hold on, so that's three, four, 40, and the six happened 30 times. I rolled the die 100 times. Now, if you're looking at this, you go, okay, this, I guess everything's possible. But man, I didn't give very many ones and threes, but I got a lot of twos and sixes. Okay, great. Here's what I'd like to know. 
I would like to know the mean, the median, and the mode, and the variance, and the standard deviation of the rolls of the die. That's it. I want to do all of those things for this, given these values. So if I want the mean, again, it's 1 plus 1 plus 1, 8 times, and then 2 plus 2 plus 2, 26 times, and so on. Or I can just multiply by my frequency, right? That's a little bit more efficient. So let's start with the sum of our values. So the sum of the outcomes would be, again, 8 times 1 plus 26 times 2 plus 9 times 3 plus 16 times 4 plus 11 times 5 plus 30 times 6. This is the sum of all my dice roll, my single die. I should say die roll, not dice roll. So eight plus. So when I add all those up, I got 386. Okay, I'm going to double check. I always do it twice. And that's what I got. So therefore, what is the mean? The mean is 386 divided by 100. I did it 100 times. And the average would be exactly 3.86. So I'm going to roll a single die. And the average of all of my rolls was a number between 1 and 6, obviously, <laughs> 3.86. Don't give it any meaning. That's, that's what it was. Now. That's the mean. To find the median, there were 100 rolls. So I need half of them is 50. So I need the roll that's between the 50th and the 51st. How do I do that? Count frequencies. 8 plus this, that's 34. 34 plus 9 is 43. If I add these guys up, that's 57. So if I go from top down, the first 41 rolls are fives and sixes. The next 16 rolls are fours, which means rolls 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. The 50th and 51st rolls are all fours, aren't they? So if I rank all 100, the median would therefore be four. Again, because four, the first 43 rolls were here, the next 16 were here. So the 50th and 51st are definitely fours. The mode would be what? Anybody, what's the mode? That's the easiest one of all. One, no, two. Okay, so we've only got three guesses left. We guessed one, two, and six. <laughs> oh, no, six, six. Sorry. Why is it six? Because it's the one with the most. The one with the highest frequency, yes. Highest frequency, that's it. So the mode is six. You don't calculate the mode, you count the mode. Median, if your scores are ranked, median, you just look for the middle. The middle, that's it. It's, it there's not a calculation, you just count. I got half on one side, half on the other. Mode is even easier. Well, 30 is the most common, so the answer has to be six. Okay, now let's do the variance because the variance calculation looks a little like this. I'm gonna change something. I'm gonna make this into a variance calculation. So the first thing I'm gonna do is say, I want the sum of the squared scores. I want one squared eight times. I want two squared 26 times and so on. Oh, I'm now gonna do this, okay? Down um, off to the side, I'm going to put this because I need to erase the other stuff. I keep setting down my eraser. Uh, I don't need this anymore. All right. So let's calculate the sum of the squared scores. So eight times one squared plus, oops, I, sorry, partially erased it. 26 times two squared. The numbers are right above me, by the way. They're right here. 26 times two. Professor, this is going to be uh, uploaded as well later on, on on your YouTube, correct? Yes, but you know, I'd like you guys to try this now. I don't want you to figure out later that <laughs> we're having difficulty. No, no, no. I, I, I'm doing it right now. I was just wondering, just in case yeah. you wanted to go back and just take more notes. Okay. That's why I'm recording it, by the way. 
I, I found it interesting because I kind of figured everybody would be here, especially the people that were absent yesterday, but it's not exactly the case. I'm a little concerned. I had somebody email me saying they checked on the Zoom yesterday and I never showed up. And I said, we had class yesterday. And they said, no, you said the review was going to be on Zoom during class time. And I'm not sure how anybody got that one, but that's 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 not a good email. That, that's not even close to anything that you guys heard or that I emailed to you. But to say they, they thought we were going to cancel class and do the class through Zoom, that doesn't make any sense, first of all. <laughs> we're going to cancel class. And yeah, that, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't good. That wasn't it. Anyway. Plus, okay, so hold on. So A times one squared plus 26 times two squared plus nine times three squared plus um, 16 times four squared plus 11 times five squared plus 30 times six squared. I always do it twice. I got 1804 and I'm gonna do it a second time just to be sure. I make missed entries just as often as you do. And I got good. I got the same thing twice. That makes me that makes me believe that I did it right because you're not going to have the same wrong answer twice. That's just not going to happen. All right. So variance. And I've got four numbers. I'm going to bring those up a little bit just to remind people. Variance. It's the sum of the squared scores minus the number times the square of the mean over the number minus one. That's it. Now let's do that calculation, all of us. Now, well, Robert, this is one that seems to give you give you a fit. So. I would suggest do the numerator completely and then divide it by 99. Yes, sir. It would be a shame to have this correct and then not have the correct value at the end. I got 3.172. Nice. Does anybody else get 3.172? Can you speak what you're punching in the calculator? I'm sorry. Yeah, 1804 minus, minus 100, 100 times, times. Enter 3.86 and then hit your squared button. Okay, okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, make, by the way, don't, don't do 3.86 times 3.86. Good, you have a squared button because what if you were doing a calculation where you had to raise it to a higher power? You don't want to keep re-entering, you just use the exponent key. Then they, you actually have a key that says x squared, probably, which is just makes it a little bit easier. I would suggest total the top and then divide it by 99. And so we said it's roughly 3.172 forever and ever and ever. Now, I want the standard deviation. Please leave the screen alone. That's what your screen looks like. Hopefully, everybody's screen looks just like this. I want the standard deviation, which we said is the square root. So check out what I'm going to do. Square root equals. <laughs> didn't, I didn't re-enter anything. I just left everything on my screen. Way simpler. And what do I get? Approximately what? Anybody? 1.78. Yeah, you go 7871. More decimals is never bad. Um, can you explain again why you got you put 99 instead of 100? Because the for variance of a sample, it's always n minus one. Variance of a population, it's always n. But in reality, you rarely, you rarely ever have a population. So you almost always do an n minus one. Now, the mathematical derivation of this, I saw in graduate courses at San Diego State, courses that literally you required a math degree to understand the derivations and how complicated, because the n minus one to the average observer, you're like, why is it n minus one and not n? It actually has to do with the bias of a calculation. It, it's less bias of a sample that's n minus one. It's it's hard to explain the rationale, but trust me, I, I saw it at the gnarliest levels that, oh, okay, the n minus one is a more true account. And here's the thing, as your sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, in other words, as the sample is getting closer to the actual population, you 
Mesa College in a normal semester would have 26, 27, 29,000 people. We're, we're a little less than that now. You want to do a sampling of Mesa students to ask them a question. So you asked 50 people, or maybe you were measuring their average height. Okay, great. What if you had time and you asked 10,000 people? <laughs> That'd be an absurdly large sample compared to the population. Do you agree? That'd be like doing an opinion and poll and asking, you know, 50 million Americans. That's, that'd be a, kind of a big poll. As the sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and heads towards the size of the population, the N versus N minus one is going to start affecting like the 10th decimal place or the 20th decimal place. In other words, it won't, it won't matter. So the bigger the sample is, the less impact the N, the N minus one would actually have. So that's, a, that's another way of thinking about it. But here's another way of thinking about it. If I have a really small sample, it only takes one extreme score to really mess it up, right? Do we understand what I mean by, you know, we're taking the average uh, income of the class and, and Bill Gates happens to be one of the students in the class. Is that gonna kind of mess up our mean and our variance? You know, Bill Gates is one of the numbers we're counting. <laughs> Probably. So another reason we, we use a slightly different number is one extreme value in a, a small sample will mess everything up. One extreme value in a large sample won't have a much impact. Okay. So Do you remember the, the word for extreme sample? You guys remember? Outlier. Good. An outlier messes up everything, but you can't ignore outliers. But we, you know, when you're doing your own stuff, you, you, you really don't want outliers. But they do happen. But the larger your sample, the less impact they have in reality. That's, that's a, one way of looking at it. That's why in real life, when people say, how big a sample should you take? The answer is yes. <laughs> take as big a sample as you can afford time and money. The bigger your sample, the more accurate your results are probably going to be. If your sample is too small, then that one outlier will just mess up everything in terms of your, your conclusions. Okay, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Now, um, let me go ahead, go back to the share screen. Flip, I am in position one again. Okay, so hold on a minute. So I'm gonna go. This is on Canvas, by the way. Okay. So here's some of the things. Now, population mean, sample mean. You see that on the cross? Um, it's the exact same formula. You know, big N is the number in the population, little n is the number in the sample. It's the same thing. It's still N, right? That's not even a thing. Population variance, the question was just asked, the N versus the N minus one. We're not going to do this. Right now, this, we will use this at some point in the course. Not right now. Right now, we're all doing samples. So we're just going to use this one. Okay. This is the formula. We just did some of the squared scores n mean squared. Okay. We're going to do, the way, and now standard deviation is the square root of the variance for both population and sample. It doesn't change. Z score is score minus mean over standard deviation, regardless of whether it's a sample or population. So at this point in the course, the only formula that is different is the variance formula. And we're not gonna do a population variance. We're only gonna do a sample variance, okay? The probability, these are the rules that we established. This one here, Venn diagram that I drew with the overlap. Do you remember that? We subtracted out the intersection because we double counted it. That's what that formula says right there. Now this is a vocab word, mutually exclusive is when there's no overlap whatsoever. This is a really simple one. I want to partition our class into everybody who's 21 and over or under 21. So one group of people will be the people that are under 21, one will be the 21 and over. Oh, how many people are in the intersection there, by the way? <laughs> how many people are both under 21 and over 21 at the same time? Or would you say there is nobody? That's, it. That's kind of impossible. So you'd say the under 21 and the over 21 groups are mutually exclusive. There is no overlap. Oh, okay. From a probability standpoint, we kind of like that one. It makes it easier to conceptualize. All right, so if there is no intersection, 
mutually exclusive. And that's the same as saying the probability is zero because there's nothing there. Complement. This is the one we did for like the at least one. Complement means everything else. So we thought dice rolls, for example. Think dice rolls. If I said, what's the complement that your sum is at least a five? The complement would be your sum is less than five. That's everything else. What's the complement of rolling doubles? Not rolling doubles. That's everything else. Complement means everything else. And so the probability of a complement was the bar on the top. Some books use a C. I don't care which one people use. The probability of the complement is one minus the probability of everything else. <laughs> That's, hopefully that just makes sense to you. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, because the probability of everything is just one. Now, matching was the same as the multiplication, if you remember. So the number of ways of doing things, I just multiply them. So the probability of doing things, I just multiply them. That's what we just, oops, sorry, don't have it here. That's what we did when we just did the cards a minute ago. The with and without replacement, we did the first thing, then we did the second thing, then we did the third thing, and we multiplied probabilities. That's why you do that, okay? Now, the one that uh, you were asking about earlier, Rosalind. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to stop yeah. you. Uh, I just got a little, I understood the definitions, mutually exclusive, you explained that, the Venn diagram, yada, yada, yada. Um, are we going over the formulas page or is that a, is that a part of a uh, practice test question? It's going to be both. No, I'm, I'm showing you which part of this you actually need. Oh, we're almost okay. done. Yeah, we're, okay. we're almost done with everything we need because look, see these formulas? They, see these formulas? They kind of keep going. See these formulas? This is a normal stats class. All of those formulas are in a stats class. We, we aren't going that far. We're almost done. Conditional probability. This was the insider information. The way you read this, if you remember, was probability of A, given that you know B occurred. Yes. Given that you know B occurred makes B the sample space. That's why the probability of B is in the denominator because given the, you know, when I said roll the dice and you saw one of them landed a five, What's the probability given that you know one of the dice is a five? Well, then my sample space was only rolls that had fives. That's why that's the denominator, okay? And then finally, we, we defined independent when I have insider information and it didn't change anything. <laughs> so what's the probability that you roll a five given you had eggs for breakfast? It's probably the same as the probability of rolling a five if I didn't know you had eggs for breakfast. So we'd say those are independent events <laughs> because one didn't affect the other. And I'm using a silly example, but that's actually what all that means. And then the last two, permutation, combination. Okay. Reference. Um, professor, yeah. am I the only one that cannot see these formulas that you have up right now? Oh, my. Oh, I, you guys not see this? I have a share screen. I don't no, see it either. I don't see it. Oh, God, now you tell me. Hold on. I have my own, but. How could you? Okay, let me go back. It just said I, like, it, it looked like it was loading, that's why. I've had this on the share screen all this time. That's just crazy. Okay, hold on. You you can't see this. Okay, now, now we see it. Oh now. my goodness, I, I apologize folks. I'm, I've been highlighting them as I've gone through them. Nobody, was there nobody that could see this? Tell me, did anybody see this? <laughs> you were looking at your own. You I said, just didn't want to interrupt you. At my we were own. talking, that's right. why. Oh my goodness, I, I apologize. So let me go back. Uh, I pointed out the sample variance, we had the N minus one in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Population variance, we have the N in the bottom. We're not gonna ever use population variance till right. way, way, way later. So I said only the sample variance. And this is the one we just did. Don't do the first version, that takes forever. If you take every value, subtract the mean and then square it, that takes forever. We did the second version, that was my shortcut. Some of the squared scores, minus n, mean squared. That's a really fast formula. You like that one. Then I said everything else is the same. Population definition for standard deviation is the square root of variance. Same thing for sample. Population z-score, score minus mean over standard deviation, same as sample. Those formulas don't change. The only formula that's actually different is variance, and it's slightly. Right? Here's where the probability again. Here's the Venn diagram, subtract out the intersection. Oh, I'm so sorry, you guys. I thought you were seeing all this. Now, let's get down to here. Permutation, that's the big P on your calculator. 
What's the difference? What about one word? The difference between permutation and combination. How do you know which one? One word starts with an O. Permutations in order, and then the other ones all scrap. Yes, order. If it's if order matters, you're finishing first, second, and third in a race. Order matters. I'm taking three of you with me to lunch. Order doesn't matter. You just just are you going to lunch or you're not going to lunch. First, second, third doesn't matter. If order matters, it's a permutation because the word permutation quite literally means arrangements. And to arrange is to put things in order. Combination, remember, think pizza. The combination pizza doesn't matter what order you put the ingredients on. It only matters what ingredients you chose. I know that sounds silly, but it's actually correct mathematics. So the, on this page, combination is the last thing. See this thing in the parentheses right there? N and the R? I haven't been using this on purpose because I wanted to use big P and big C because those are the keys on your calculator. But if you're reading any textbook, all textbooks use this, N and R in the parentheses. That's sort of the universal notation. So I want you to be aware. So if you're if you were looking something up on the internet or or you have a statistics book or you're doing the open stacks and you get to this and you see that notation, you go, wait a minute, what does that mean? That's combination notation. Does that make sense? It's it's what is used in all the math books. I've been doing it the capital C. All of these say the same thing. I've been using the capital C because that's what you see on your calculator. You see a capital C and you see a capital P. At this point of the game, you have to know where those keys are on your calculator. You can't be you know, wondering, and you have to know where the factorial key is on your calculator, because you're not going to calculate a factorial. You're just going to tell me what the result is. I mean, you can use the keys on your calculator, because the numbers are usually too big. So as long as you hit the right numbers, and of course, every time you enter anything on the calculator, always do it two times. And when you get the same answer twice, you have to trust that answer. That, that was the answer you were supposed to get. Has it happened to anybody in here where you were doing calculator stuff and you did it twice and you got a different answer? Has that happened? It happens to most people. <laughs> so then what do you do? Do it the third time. <laughs> At some point, you need to get the same answer twice in a row to ensure that you hit the right buttons. Because a lot of us, we go too fast and we hit a wrong button somewhere, you know, and then, then it all falls apart. Okay. So in terms of what you should bring to the test, I would bring... I'll actually keep it real simple. I would bring the first page. Of this. You don't need the last one. We don't, we're not doing the last one. The first page of this has every single formula we have used. Now, using this sheet, feel free to write down definitions. Um, I would strongly suggest doing something like this. This one here, this is the formula that came directly from the Venn diagram where we had the intersecting circles to make it the visual easier. By all means, draw a picture of the Venn diagram right next to it to remind yourself what it actually that is saying. There's nothing wrong with that. If that helps you understand it better. Um, let's see. So we are allowed to bring this page. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I, I don't. A lot of people think of memorization as a way. You know, when you're learning a language, you have to memorize vocabulary because there's no logical basis. It's, you know, this is what the word means. But in mathematics, it's do you know which formula you're supposed to use and do you know how to correctly use that formula? Simply memorizing formulas doesn't, you know, no one's ever going to ask you to regurgitate a bunch of formulas. They're going to say, can you correctly execute the thing? So I'm going to give you some numbers and ask you for the mean. Well, I can write down the formula for mean, Mr. Brown. I don't know how to calculate it, but I know how to write it down. Well, that doesn't do any good. No, I'm going to give you the formula. I want to see you correctly use the formula and then give me an answer. So I, I always, this every math class I teach, I let them use the formulas because having the formulas isn't going to help you get a right answer if you don't know how to do the problem. But if you know how to do the problem, I don't want you stressing on the formula. You know, The details of a formula, you do a formula a few times, you already know the formula. If I ask anybody here, I give you a bunch of numbers, find the mean. You're all going to add them up and divide by the number of numbers. You, you all, you're all going to do that. But then we formally, we formally define it oh, right here. Step all the things, divide by the number of things. <laughs> That's all that says. We know that. But sometimes it's good to see it formally written down. So this absolutely you can use and you can write all over it. Okay. And by the way, what sort of things should you write? you don't know um vocab 
Do you, do you feel pretty comfortable with the vocab? Probably. Will you automatically feel comfortable day of? Eh, maybe, probably. But you, you know, sometimes we have just total brain locks. <laughs> so if, for example, let's say you want to write down some of the vocab. So you have, you write down discrete continuous. What would you, what would you say to help you distinguish the two? Because in my calculus classes, sometimes they don't know the difference. I say discrete count, continuous measurement. Oh, so how tall you are would be a measurement. You can report that with decimals, right? How many children you have? You can only count that. <laughs> That's discrete. How tall you are is a measurement. So that would be continuous. Keep it as simple as humanly possible. Parameter versus statistic. You're going to use one word for each. Parameter starts with a P. Parameter has to do only with population. Population. Statistic starts with an S. Statistic has only to do with sample. Beautiful. That that if you're gonna write something, write that. Don't confuse yourself by writing a book. <laughs> it's not gonna help you. <laughs> you know, nominal. I say name only. What would the interval be? I was thinking internal, because like internal temperature. Okay, I'll just say temp. <laughs> just say yeah. temperature. <laughs> now, what would you say for ordinal? Well, that was actually easy. Order. Order. Ordinal order. Yeah. Give yourself simple cues. When it comes to things like vocab, I would never use more than one word on any of these because it's only going to lend for confusion because you already know. You're, as a friend of mine says, you're 99% half certain already, right? If you're 99% half certain, that's a little less than half, I think. But you, you don't need, you just need something to tip, to tip you over. Okay, I, I'm right there. Oh, yeah, it's that one. You already know you want assurance. You want absolute certainty. Do you know what you do when you're not absolutely certain? You change answers. You can't change answers. When you have an answer and you're certain, you walk away. You wave at it and you walk away. Okay, now a reminder. We'll, that's all we're doing on Tuesday. We're doing the test. When you're done, you leave. Okay, try not to be late. There, it's very stressful. And you, anybody who's done this before, if you walk into a test late, it takes you a while just to calm your nerves down because you're already stressing out. Oh my God, I'm, I'm gonna run out of time. No, you're not gonna run out of time. That's all we're gonna do. You got more time than you need. But come in there totally calm. Please be properly caffeinated when you get there. I don't wanna see anybody walking in with a full mug of coffee that has not been attacked yet. Again. If that coffee is not coursing through your veins before you start taking the test, then you're kind of missing the point. Yeah, you're not going to drink your coffee after the test. Coffee is, is basically like super soldier serum, you know, as far as I'm concerned for a test. I don't even care if you ate breakfast. Have your caffeine, please. And no Red Bulls. I, I see you guys outside eat. Ah, that just makes it glow in the dark and, 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 and get violently shaking. <laughs> the way you can't, you can't bring food into the classroom, but, you know, be nourished before you come. Be relaxed. Be calm. Be there. I don't need you there a half hour early. Be there at least a couple of minutes early so that you're already relaxed. Some people like to sit down and just sort of chill for a few minutes, just kind of get their thoughts. If you walk into the room and the, the class has been going for 15 minutes or taking a test, you already know what that's going to do to your psyche. You're going to be a mess for the next 15 minutes, right? While you're trying to just get yourself in order. Nah, I don't want you to do that. It's, Tests are stressful enough. When you're done with the test, you can hand it in. You're going to go home. I'll have them done fairly quickly. And again, it's an exam. It's just, it's a measurement of where are you right at that moment of time. It is not a reflection of where you're going to be in a month. It's not a measure of what kind of person you are. Some people take tests very, you know, they take it personally. It's like, no, a wrong answer doesn't mean you're a bad person. <laughs> oh, you might be a bad person anyway, you know. <laughs> but it's, what did you know that day? And then we move on, you know. You get to drop certain things. It's, but it's sure nice when you get things right. It's a, it's a validation that what you were doing works. Right? And a lot of you are doing some really good stuff. Just continue, right? Does anybody have any last minute questions? Because we've actually been going at this for exactly two hours, if you can do that. Yikes. So okay. what's the probability that we will do well on this exam given that we have uh, practiced today? 
hopefully higher than if you hadn't done today. <laughs> I, think I, like that safe, I think that's a safe answer. answer. Um, I would strongly suggest everybody go over the practice test. Now, I, I do want to comment that I, I goofed up yeah. on, the, on the problems 10 to 16, where I said the five core coins flip simultaneously. When you repractice, go to the key. Do the problem that's on the key. If you, even though we did the problem and I wrote all the answers, on the key, I, I don't know how I did that, but I changed the problem on the key. Just do that problem because the answers are already there. Cover up the answers. Do that problem. That was the one where I had the sum of the scores is 510 and you guys couldn't figure out how the heck I got that. Well, if you saw my key, then you'd totally understand. I have a different set of numbers somehow or another. <laughs> but when you here's a simple way of doing it is print the key and cover up the answers. Do the problems and immediately uncover the answers. You know, just so you can just check as you go. It, it's kind of unhelpful to be looking at the answer before you start the problem. You do know that, right? <laughs> I have the answer. Now I'm going to start the problem. No, cover up the answer. Do the problem and then say, did I get the right answer? That's probably more worthwhile. All right, guys. Have a wonderful rest of the weekend. Um, I'm giving you the rest of today off. Okay, just saying. Um, and I will stop recording. Let me get up the share screen now. Okay. And you guys, again, have a wonderful rest of the day and a horrific